Exactly. Okay. So we're ready to get started. I want to thank everybody from attending and, and folks online uh, for this year's uh, Robert uh, Suskin and Leslie Lewinter Suskin Faculty Prize in Global Health. And you see Leslie and Robert on the screen. Uh, they have a long, long standing dedication to global work. Uh, they do it as partners, as they always share, and I'm sure they'll comment on this. Uh, I, I don't know how many years it dates back, but a long time uh, <laughs> all over the world, all over the world, spanning Great. everything from medical education to research to clinical care and everything you can imagine around that space. Uh, here in the United States, uh, so Bob's been a dean, he's been a department chair, he started uh, medical schools, et cetera. Um, but also running institutes in countries around the world. And, you know, uh, they were incredibly generous, I guess now about seven years ago, and created a uh, Global Health Prize for our medical students. So we give that award out usually every spring, uh, along with the medical student uh, graduation. Um, and then about three plus years ago, coming on four years, because Carrie will be the third, uh, they established this award for uh, the faculty, uh, the faculty global health award and prize. And so they've endowed that and we're incredibly grateful to them for doing that because it highlights both the importance of the work and, you know, is a, a nice accolade for our faculty who work incredibly hard, often without uh, the recognition that they deserve uh, for working in the global space, which isn't the easiest thing to do as we all, we all know. So uh, Bob and Leslie, thank you again. And I'll turn to you because I know you'd like to make a few comments. And I also know you had a chance to talk to Carrie beforehand. So why don't we hear from you just for a little bit and then I'll introduce Carrie. Right. You first. Well, I'll start off because uh, basically uh, we were just at, at Penn a, a few months ago for our 60th reunion uh, for our class. Uh, and back uh, 60 years ago, there was no global health. Uh, I had the good fortune of, uh, as a third year medical student, uh, having uh, an award called the Smith Klein and French Foreign Fellowship. And that really made a tremendous difference in my life because number one, uh, it allowed me to recruit my wife of 60 years, uh, who I met as a third year medical student there. Uh, and at the time, uh, I was not able to get a date with her until I told her that I was going to Africa, uh, French Cameroon, uh, to work in a mission hospital. Uh, and then I got my first date. And when I came back about uh, uh, three months later, I proposed to her because in those days, there were very few uh, women who wanted to go to Africa. And she said, okay, I'll marry you, but we have to go back to Africa. And that started our journey around the world working uh, in Africa, we spent two years in, in Senegal as a uh, Peace Corps physician uh, in Northern Thailand, where I was the field director of an NIH, so at that time the largest NIH uh, grant overseas. And subsequently in our, in our work uh, that has taken us around the world in global health. I'm a pediatrician. Uh, I have been the founding dean of three new medical schools in the US and California and Texas, uh, and the role that the, what has happened in, at the Penn in global health is just so gratifying uh, to see that, that the, the role that Glenn Galton and the whole team have made uh, and the impact that they have had, uh, not only in Vietnam, but Ukraine uh, and around the world, with the faculty um, focusing their efforts and making a difference globally. So we are so happy uh, to have established this award. Uh, and I'm going to turn it now over to my boss, uh, Leslie, uh, who will say a few words about what global health has meant uh, to us and, um, and the impact that we've had uh, globally. I think the most important thing to me, um, marrying somebody with whom I could work, because when he did the work in Thailand. I did the field research when we were in, in uh, Senegal. I worked concomitantly with him uh, in the field. Uh, I think the most important thing to me is that everyone in this whole world recognizes that we are global. We are one species on one very, very vulnerable planet. And eventually to have this planet survive and have this entire species survive we must learn to give each other mutual support everywhere, 
no matter what language we speak, no matter what country we come from, no matter how we conduct our lives, um, hopefully very constructively. And I salute you because, you know, we're leaving, you know, with a lot of problems in this world. And we salute you for trying to make those problems disappear and to ameliorate constructively the problems that occur now. So bravo to you. And I'm so glad so that I, only because I can speak to you that I married this man. Thank you guys. Uh, and again, you're, you're so incredibly generous. You're the best. You got a few years to go though. I think Rosalind and Jimmy Carter have a couple of years on your marriage. So hang in there. <laughs> plus years at least. Well, thanks again. Uh, so it now gives me great pleasure to introduce this year's winner. Uh, you all know who the winner is, so no big surprise, of the Lewinter Susskind Faculty Prize, of course, uh, Carrie Cohn. Uh, so Carrie is currently the Associate Professor uh, and Associate Professor of Clinical Practice, uh, Pediatrics here at Penn, uh, and an attending physician and Director of Global Health and Bioresponse in the Division of Emergency Medicine at CHOP. Uh, Carrie's commitment to global health spans her entire career and encompasses many countries, um, if not continents. Carrie graduated from Drexel Med here, obviously in Philly, and did her residency in pediatrics at CHOP. And following this, she spent time with Medicine Sans Frontier, working as the lead expat physician during the then Civil War in Cote d'Ivoire. She then honed her research skills at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and returned to the US for her clinical fellowship at Boston Children's Hospital. Uh, never satisfied with the routine, and what might have been the path that they expected her to follow, Carrie designed and implemented the combined ID Emergency Medicine Fellowship, which then, and I think largely to this day, you know, serves as a model for how to combine specialized skills in emergency medicine that traditionally came from disparate uh, disciplines. Um, so her time in Boston um, included during her fellowship work in Uganda and then the Dominican Republic, a lot of this, not surprisingly, given the, the fellowship combination of ID and EM, focused on rapid diagnosis, urgent care, of uh, areas like Lyme disease, tuberculosis, et cetera, et cetera. But it also included interest in childhood malnutrition, a topic that she actually shares with Bob and Leslie because they've also um, worked in this space. So upon her return to Philly as uh, both Penn faculty and uh, uh, of course her uh, responsibilities at Children's Hospital, she created and now leads the combined PEDS Emergency Medicine Global Health Fellowship, and her work has uh, certainly not paused on the global uh, space, including projects in Sierra Leone. This was back with Medicine Sans Frontier and the Ebola crisis a few years ago, work in Liberia, and more recently she's been helping us, among many other things, uh, helping us with the creation of the pediatric residency program in Vietnam. Um, as mentioned earlier, at the very beginning, Penn, uh, Carrie um, now leads the CHOP bioresponse effort and indeed is a nationally renowned uh, global health expert. But perhaps I was going to say, you know, my notes that I wrote earlier said just as important. I'm going to say more importantly, she's an incredible and dedicated mentor. And many, many people in the audience and those, uh, you know, who are not able to be with us today have benefited from her incredible generosity, both of knowledge and of spirit and dedication to all of us are colleagues. So Carrie, it's a great pleasure to congratulate you on this award. We look forward to hearing from you. I'll be back at the end. We'll take some questions. And I want to remind everybody we have a reception afterwards, but we'll say more about that at the end. Carrie, you guys go. I feel like Glenn kind of said it all, so maybe I don't have much to say. Uh, all right, what did I do wrong? Yeah. All right. All right, well, it's such an honor to be invited here to talk about my career and to be the recipient of this really career milestone prize in global health. Um, I had the pleasure of spending time with Bob and Leslie earlier in the year and was so inspired by their life stories um, and their continued dedication to global health um, and, um, and their never ending like upbeat spirit as you guys have already seen. Um, 
Uh, I'm going to tell you about my life and my career, but I felt it really important to say that there's almost nothing that I do that isn't without the Um, and so with that, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about when I was a first year medical student. So at that time, I spent the summer in rural Ghana, shadowing in a hospital. And for those of you, you who don't know me, I'm a lifelong runner. And after work from the hospital each day, I'd go home and I'd go for a run um, through the village that we were staying in. And there was this little boy named Courage, and he had this same single green t-shirt with a, a hole worn up in front um, and I could recognize him um, always with his uh, with his t-shirt and he would come out and run with me and he would run as fast barefoot as I ran with my shiny Nikes um, and um, kind of grew on me and became my friend throughout that summer um, and um, quite a few weeks into my stay he showed up in the hospital and uh, he had been bitten by a dog previously and developed rabies. And for three days, I watched him die a torturous death. And it was the most devastating thing that I had ever seen in my entire life. And I walked away thinking, how is it that this little boy who had gr so grown on me couldn't be saved from this preventable disease? And why does one life matter less than others, depending heavily on the circumstances and location? where we were born and how can we truly achieve equity so that health is a fundamental and non-negotiable human right. And uh, then I thought, oops, sorry. And then I thought if I wasn't willing to try to solve the problem, then who would be? Um, my life's work in global health has been an evolution it's become a part of my identity and um, even ingrained in my family's lives. Um, many of you don't know this, but I studied sociology in college and I was fascinated with how there are so many factors that influence health outcomes and health equity. And that it's so much more than just having the right medicine in the right place or enough doctors. And as medical school went on, um, I continued to travel in India. I helped on wards of patients with measles, entire wards of typhoid and hepatitis. My eyes had really been opened and I, I couldn't go back. Um, as Glenn mentioned, I pursued a residency in pediatrics here at CHOP and continued to embrace global health as my passion, despite the way more than 80 hour work weeks that I think no longer exist. <laughs> um, and in my second and third year, um, as a resident, I went on CHOP's very first mission trip to the Dominican Republic, where we worked in the Haitian migrant communities after my experience as a medical student, I was really keen to study infectious diseases and I conducted this study. Um, but the study was, it was about tuberculosis, but it wasn't really about tuberculosis. Tuberculosis. It was really about equity. The economic migrant population that lives in the Batés traditionally come from Haiti to work in the sugarcane fields. They have little access to healthcare, although local clinics with some CHOP partnership was going out monthly to try to offer some free care. In this study, I looked at incidents and risk factors, but what we were really trying to do was partner with local experts, produce good research, and bring awareness to propagate change. After residency, I so desperately wanted to specialize in global health, but there were no fellowships or training programs at the time. And Often when I told people what I wanted to do, the response was like, oh, you really like to travel and go on vacation. And I swear people said this um, so tactlessly. And so for as long as people were gonna discredit what I was trying to do, I felt like change would never happen. This is a photo that I took of Mount Everest when my sister and I were climbing to base camp during medical school. And um, the mountain where I'm going is so big uh, and it's not really clear how to get there from here. Um, I just know I'm still down here at the beginning and haven't even hit the snow yet. I know there might be physical challenges like exhaustion, hunger and altitude sickness. And I know there may be unex the ex unexpected, like for example, an unwelcome case of typhoid at 20,000 feet. Um, 
but I'm still just here trying my darndest to get me to the place that I need to be. And so after a lot of thought, I pitched the idea of doing a combined fellowship in both pediatric infectious diseases and emergency medicine. My best calculation on how I might get the skills I needed to take the next step in doing right for kids just like Courage. I decided to go to Boston Children's Hospital, but the program needed to be approved by dual boards. So in the interim, I left the United States for some practical global health experience. Chu Boake was where I grew up as a doctor. The day I graduated pediatric residency, I boarded a plane and I went to Africa to volunteer uh, with Medicine Sans Frontier. I ran a university-sized hospital in the rebel zone of the Ivory Coast during their civil war, where I supervised 25 mostly senior local medical students who were all that were left after the war created brain drain. And I taught them everything I knew and I learned very quickly the skills that I didn't learn in residency, like how to put in an IV. Mondays and Wednesdays are rounded on the pediatrics unit. We had 40 beds and more than 40 patients with a mortality of eight and a half percent. Tuesdays and Thursday mornings, I rounded with internal medicine and visited the surgical wards or the outpatient clinics in the afternoon. And Friday, I rounded on the tuberculosis ward. We joked about the CAT scan, a scanner on the roof. We donated blood to our own patients with the hope to help them survive. I really liked that I worked along locally hired staff and as in the mission of MSF, I shared responsibility to bear witness during this terrible war. Bags of, bags of blood, despite the high prevalence of HIV in this area and IV medication theft was a frequent inside job. The sad truth of war turning really good people to desperation. I also learned things that I never thought I needed to know, like how to put IOs in unique places when other options were blown, how to de-escalate a soldier, a soldier with a gun in my emergency room, and how to sweet talk the head of the rebel army after his prisoner escape. How to speak round and live in the local dialect of African French. I learned how cholera tents were constructed and how to run a malnutrition ward and how viral hemorrhagic fever was tested for in rural and remote places. And we saved lives. Actually, a lot of them. But I was increasingly aware that being a doctor, providing direct care alone, was never going to be enough. The sociologist in me knew that there were greater factors here. I understood I was saving lives and teaching those around me, but I also knew that it was time to go and learn more. I felt that if I was going to be an expert in global health, I needed to get my diploma in tropical medicine and hygiene. This brought academics to my practice and brought in my understanding of the determinants of health. And this is literally me catching mosquitoes to study on the, under the microscope. I returned to the US to Boston where I started my five-year fellowship in pediatric infectious disease and emergency medicine. I did a master in public health at Harvard focusing on clinical effectiveness and global health. And I partnered with the Massachusetts General Hospital Center for Global Health. And when a trip to South Sudan, uh, derailed due to political instability, I found myself in rural southwest Uganda, where a colleague was starting an amazing task shifting program, teaching nurses to become emergency care practitioners in a location where there were very few doctors. This was an overwhelmingly young and un uneducated area of sustenance farmers, many of whom lacked clean water. In the Nachibali emergency room, malnourished children were coming in with malaria, pneumonia, tuberculosis, and sepsis. In a world where greater than 45% of the under five mortality worldwide is caused in part by malnutrition, treating with antimicrobials wasn't gonna solve any underlying problem. But nobody seemed to have the bandwidth to see or maybe more so have the energy to address the bigger picture. Malnutrition is neither the usual scope of the emergency room nor the infectious disease physician. But when I was here providing emergency and pediatric care, I realized that if I really wanted to help, it couldn't just, again, be about me seeing patients. It had to be about me listening to what my colleagues needed and creating a bi-directional partnership to fix the underlying issues. That summer, we did an assessment of 
the Rukunjiri community to better understand the structural and social determinants of disease. I engaged with the local government's board of the hospital, the Minister of Health and the district and the local health and the local district health officer. We focused heavily on education and created a curricula which trained all the nurses and doctors to screen for and provide inpatient care for severe acute malnutrition. Our mortality dropped from 4.8% to 1%. We opened a canteen on hospital grounds where 80% of the profit would cycle back into the program to encourage sustainability. We bought cows to make our own therapeutic milk. Even I learned how to task shift. Never knew I needed to know how to milk a cow. Harvard undergrads came every winter and summer break to help uh, expand the program. We trained all of the health centers in the entire district to treat moderate acute malnutrition as an outpatient and, worth, and worked with community health workers to screen children in remote areas. We created um, an educational garden initiative where we taught parents of inpatients to grow food and feed their children balanced nutrition and actually had a garden on the hospital grounds where while they were there, they were expected to go and work in the garden and then could bring the food back to eat. We also created a feeding mothers program. We had um, a very high rate of um, kids after they were on the ward for a couple of days, the parents would just pick them up and leave, even though they were still malnourished and still really ill. And it turns out the reason was because the mom had nothing to eat. Um, and so we realized we had to feed them if we wanted their children to stay. We created a nursing school curriculum um, that students were required to take and provided student nursing team, a student nursing team great mentorship. We created staff refresher courses to keep up their skills, invested in a program that reviewed inpatient pediatric ward quality care. And we should restructure this entire program as a model for reproducibility elsewhere in the region. And in local schools, because nutritional education seemed to be a risk factor here, as a collaboration with the Minister of Agriculture, we taught children to grow and eat a wide variety of balanced foods. And this is us building their irrigation system. She found lots of things that I never knew I needed to know. And in that time, some kids still died, but a lot of kids thrived. And this is Ronnie. Um, we found him in a very, very rural area with what used to be known as Kwashiorkor. Um, and he came to visit me. He was about three in that picture. He couldn't walk. He didn't talk. Um, and he came to visit me um, the first, his first day of kindergarten. And this is what he looked like. Um, after six years of this program, we transitioned to the local government governance. One of those original Ugandan emergency care practitioner is an invited speaker at this week's CHOP Global Health Conference and is arriving at the airport as we speak, as I speak. Um, and um, many of those Harvard students became physicians, public health professionals, or founders of their own NGOs in Africa. As this program became more self-sufficient, I realized how much the world could use more professionals willing to work with local physicians and public health officials to create change and I began thinking about next steps. I wanted to create more physician leaders in global health, both at home and globally, while continuing to follow my passion for improving health equity and the lives of others where, whenever the opportunity arose. There really felt still to be a lot of stigmata around being a global health physician in academic medicine, um, but I didn't wanna be hired under false pretenses to do something that I wasn't passionate about. So again, I pitched my case um, not only did I want to expand global health at CHOP, but I wanted to create a global health program within the Division of Emergency Medicine and create global health fellowships that provide the skill and opportunities for success. I didn't want um, to be offered a job if my new boss wasn't supportive of this vision, at least in principle. Um, I moved to Philly and I joined CHOP as faculty and Kathy Shaw and Rodney Finale gave me a platform. And with that, I created a combined fellowship in emergency medicine and global health to train pediatric physicians committed to careers in global emergency medicine. I picked Alex as my first fellow, just right up there. <laughs> um, and she'll, she'll make recurring appearances on my slides. She was, um, she was really experienced and already committed to everything that I was passionate about. So she was a total shoe in for success. Um, and some very wise person said, pick somebody that's gonna really succeed and it's gonna make you look good. And they were completely right. 
Um, and at that time, along with ultrasound, our division of emergency medicine embraced global health as an area of novel development. During the 2014-2016 West, West Ebola epidemic, my chief and colleagues in the Division of Emergency Medicine supported me to return to West Africa, again to volunteer with Medicines Sans Frontier. As an emergency infectious disease physician, I joined a team in both Sierra Leone and worked in an Ebola management center. This was another defining experience for me because it really changed the way I understood the factors that played into public health. Now, as a doctor, I'm used to always thinking about how patient care comes first. But here, I had to think about things differently so that more people ultimately could survive. The first most important thing was biosafety. This was a bioresponse mission. It felt like being in a war zone, kind of like in the Ivory Coast, except for the enemy was completely invisible. The rules were necessary to keep me safe, but suffocating when I was trying to give patient care. It didn't always feel good, and I had to frequently remind myself that I was not useful as a dead doctor. For Ebola control, immediate isolation had to be the priority, not patient care. Because the latent period is longer than the incubation pe period, patients develop symptoms before they become infectious to others. So if individuals are promptly isolated when they develop symptoms, it might be possible to reduce the number of people they're able to infect get the sick isolated, stop transmission. You would think it's easy, but the pre-existing social, political, and geographical conditions complicated everything. Disease doesn't live in a vacuum, and when it profits from the surrounding conditions, it can be devastating. And then lastly was patient care, and we tried our best with very few resources. I spent a lot of time there reflecting, why was I here? so many years later asking myself again about health equity. How do, we meet, how do we better tackle structural and social determinants of disease? How do we fight against an invisible enemy that kicks us when we're down, be it an organism, politics, climate change, or other threat? How do we create leaders home and abroad with unique skills to tackle all of the threats and injustices in an informed and effective way? And how do we better prepare our world for epidemics? While I was in Sierra Leone, in addition to treating Ebola, I was assigned the task of caring for patients with G-tubes necessitated by accidental esophageal injury. Soon after, Alex again, who was working next door in Liberia, saw a constant flow of patients with something called caustic soda ingestion. After discussing with local families and providers, it became clear that there was a dangerous substance harming children and no one was doing anything about it. I was lucky enough to keep Alex as our second PEM Global Health faculty member at CHOP, and we teamed up with Liberian partners to both identify and try to tackle the problem. Caustic soda is used in Liberia to make soap and is a common household cleaner. In a solid form, it looks like salt or sugar. You can see that right up here. In its liquid form, it looks like water and is completely odorless and tasteless. It's a frequent cause of ingestion injuries in children. And when the child picks up that cup of what they think is water and they go to drink it, it causes necrosis on contact. This leads to significant morbidity and mortality. And at the time, there was no published data on caustic soda ingestion in Liberia and no prevention programs existed. So we decided we had to do something. Um, we came up with the idea of a three-phased approach, and this project over the years has gotten support from the CHOP Global Health Pilot Grant, the Melissa Community Endowment Fund, and the Nicholas Cardinale Chair Fund. Our first phase was to examine how caustic soda was used in Liberia to figure out what was going on. Where was the actual problem? How were these kids getting to this caustic? The second phase is to determine the incidence of caustic soda ingestions in Liberia and review the circumstances around the actual ingestions that were happening. And we knew we needed to do this because we knew nobody was going to pay attention if we just said, hey, we think there's a problem. We need to come with data and say, look, we have numbers. This is the number of people on your wards where this is happening. 
And then our last phase was to develop a culturally appropriate pilot prevention program and utilize our data to lobby for change. In 2016, we partnered with two Liberian physicians and a Liberian nurse who happened to be an expert in caustic soda ingestion. We held focus groups in six Liberian counties with two identified stakeholder groups. The first were parents of young children, less than five years of age. And the second were people who make soap using caustic soda. Um, we collected data from these focus groups until thematic saturation was reached. And with this study, we were really able to identify the timeline of caustic access in the home, the high risk times for accidental exposures, possible areas of intervention, while still being sensitive to the economic dependence of soap makers on caustic for their livelihood. We discovered that parents and soap makers alike supported prevention programs, but the information that we needed to develop a successful intervention program was still unclear. And so we pr proceeded to phase two where we needed to prove to public health officials that caustic soda ingestion was a real problem that affected morbidity and mortality in the children of their community. Because of course, no prevention program can be affected, effective without the support of local governments and community. Unfortunately, um, this study was severely affected by the COVID pandemic and we enrolled less patients than anticipated. But we were able to compare patients with caustic soda injury and their peer controls in order to identify risk factors, both such as both recent and any prior storage of caustic soda in the home and lack of any schooling in any adult family member. So this is kind of where we're at now. Our next steps are to submit this manuscript and, um, and then develop our most exciting part for me at least, which is our prevention program. Um, and, you know, I just, like everything we do, this is not just about the patients or hoping to conquer this disease, um, but rather answering the question of how do we continue to educate ourselves and our peers to become leaders to improve health equity um, worldwide. And here are our Liberian partners. Um, and we worked with each of them to teach them and often learn together the process of each step of doing clinical research so that they could continue this type of work in the future. Uh, in 2018 and 2023, Jethro and then Maima came to the US to present our research at the annual Pediatric Academic Society meeting, opening them up to a whole new world of academic medicine. In 2018, Glenn approached Alex and I to join Penn in the Vin Group Penn Alliance to help develop a pediatric residency program in Vietnam. Through the support of Andrew and the Center of Global Health, and with a lot of collaboration with CHOP residents and faculty, we created a robust curriculum. And for me, the reason why this program is so cool is that when you teach new residents and med students, this will raise the bar for the quality of medical education throughout the country. Those physicians will graduate and go out and work both in public and private sector, maybe, um, maybe one, maybe the other, and often both. And they will teach both colleagues and students and the children of that country will benefit and families will benefit and public health will benefit. This type of education affects both the direct health of patients as well as non-medical factors that influence health outcomes. In 2019, we began a relationship as an, acad as an academic part partner to White River Indian Health Service. Despite a global pandemic, we've been able to cultivate this relationship. We provide ongoing programs and simulations for pediatric emergencies, sexual assault response training, and approach to pediatric bronchiolitis. I received frequent texts from their team asking us for academic teaching or to participate in their pediatric M&M conferences. In addition, I've had the absolute pleasure uh, of working with one of my fellows, Liz Sanso, on her telesimulation project throughout the Indian Health Service in Native Alaska to improve pediatric readiness. And now most recently, we're working across CHOP to begin a program to support autism diagnosis so that these children can access treatment. Well, then it all hit home. Suddenly, global health even more obviously to everybody else became local health. 
and I found myself one of the only people who had ever dealt with a comprehensive response to what was at the time a very scary, highly infectious organism. In the time that my poor mother was running around after my twin three-year-olds trying to impress upon them the importance of preschool remote learning in French, a language that she does not speak, <laughs> I was <laughs> in the CHOP Hospital Command Center working alongside CHOP leaders to create just-in-time bioresponse program that would keep our safe, staff safe and our patients well cared for. And then once again, Local health became global health when the Taliban took over the control, control of Kabul and there was a large scale evacuation of Afghan citizens, thousands of whom passed through Philadelphia International Airport and the majority of whom were children. Many of us in global health and emergency room physicians worked late nights in the airport to welcome and address health concerns. And we were active in CHOP's response to provide high quality specialized care to this vulnerable population. And in addition to continuing as our divisional director of global health in the emergency room, this year I've taken on a newly created role of medical director of bioresponse for the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. This is a role unique to CHOP, and we are a regional receiving facility for pediatric patients with high consequence pathogens such as Ebola or the next unknown pathogen. We've created a bioresponse surveillance program that tracks both mundane and less common bioorganisms of potential impact. We do point of, point of entry travel screening at every point of entry in all of the CHOP system. And we have specialized facilities both within the emergency room and within the um, pediatric intensive care unit to um, be able to take care of these highly contagious patients. We do forced e-learnings and in-person trainings for all of our emergency physicians and PICU physicians that um, are expected to be able to take care of these patients if they walk off the street. And we do multidisciplinary exercises, um, both at CHAP alone, including functional and tabletop exercises, also with our colleagues at HUP, and then also regionally with Johns Hopkins and, um, and elsewhere in our FEMA region. I've also been an active leader in the executive board of the American Academy of Pediatrics section on global health Separately, and perhaps one of the things that I've been very excited about is that I've had the opportunity over the past, past four years to, look, walk, to, to work alongside Alex and Andrew and other amazing Global Health Fellowship education leaders throughout the country to standardize Global Health Fellowship training requirements and attain the possibility of program accreditation under the umbrella of the Academic Pediatric Association. This past year, I was part of the committee to accredit the very first Global Health Fellowship program ever something my younger self would have wished to have as an opportunity so many years ago. So I wanted to take this opportunity um, to thank the Division of Emergency Medicine and the support of the CHOP Global Health Center. It's been a crazy and exciting 11 years since I've joined CHOP as faculty. Our fellowships have expanded and continued within the emergency room we have a section of um, not six faculty members who continue to expand global health programs, education, advocacy, and research, and fully embrace global health as local health and health equity as the gold standard. Our fellows and faculty teach global medicine in all different facets, locally, nationally, and internationally. We are active participants as faculty in the annual CHOP Global Health Conference. And for the last six years, we've done every other year trainings in helping babies breathe tomorrow. If you guys, it's registration still open if you see myself or Alex. Um, and uh, Global Health Emergency Skills Boot Camp to teach trainees and pediatricians from all over these uh, important skills in global health. And there are also so many projects that I've either supported or been intimately involved in that I didn't even get discuss to discuss here today because they told me I only could talk for 30 minutes. And with that, um, I'd like to say thank you to Bob and Leslie Suskind and the Penn Center for Global Health for recognizing me for the work that I do and for continuing to be a force of inspiration for all of us in global health. To my colleagues and mentors, both international and domestic, who have each shaped me into who I am and helped me craft my career. 
including many of whom are, are in this room. To my fellows, trainees and students who have taught me so much about how to support other people in a way that's effective and how to open my mind to new ways of thinking, new ways of being and new ways of bringing good into the world. To my family, my three kids that you can see here who have brought me unconditional love and a whole new challenge of motherhood. Um, and my mom who helps care for them and often me when I'm working too many late hours on my next crazy project. Um, to my patients near and far who represent all the children of this world who deserve the best care that we can provide no matter where they're born and to courage who has given me the courage to continue against all odds to work towards health equity in this world. And I remain excited to see what my future brings. Oh, there they go. Okay. okay. Go. So in, in addition to the award, I actually would like a DNA sample. We want to clone you. <laughs> uh, no, you think I'm joking. I am not. Because when we say global, well, we say global because we understand that there are severe differences and lines going through that give us perimeters to what we do. You have proven that we are one globe and we have to care for everybody on that globe. And bravo to you for what you do. And we are cloning you, just so you know. Yeah, you're here. Thank Absolutely. you. Yeah, yeah. I think. All right. Questions. I've got one. Maybe I'll start. Um, so I, you know, I don't know. It's been my experience, and I'm less experienced in this field than nearly everybody here. Um, that when we are with our immediate colleagues, there's tremendous acknowledgement, enthusiasm, dedication to the projects. But then often there's a gap between the group we're working with locally or maybe even the local hospital up through the various levels of, I'm going to say, typically in other countries, you know, the various ministries that are actually guiding and controlling global health or the health of their country. So how do you, you know, what have you found as success steps for moving from the local enthusiasm so that the changes you're implementing can have a lasting impact by being incorporated more into the, you know, the sort of the, the guts of, uh, of the country or the local, you know, the, the districts or whatever it is. Because that's always been a challenge that, I mean, not always, but it's a challenge I frequently see. Yeah, no, I mean, I've definitely come across this again and again and again throughout my career. I mean, I think the goal is that the motivation has to come from within the community or within the physicians, the ones that are kind of frontline. It can't come from you know, a handshake with the Minister of Health. And of course that has to happen, but the motivation has to come from within the community. And the project, the need has to come from them too. So you know, he might come in and say, you know, okay. I see that you need this. And you can say that as many times as you want, but nothing's gonna happen unless that is actually what, people want so that's that's my thought it's, it's really hard it is hard I, I, my, my mantra on this is make it somehow cost effective for the ministry because you know oftentimes things boil down to things that are just strictly monetary uh, from their perspectives so you know, you've got to blend all these things together others andrew you have any comments or... yeah okay andrew's going to go and then we'll return to you bob Okay. Thanks, Kerry. Congratulations. Fantastic career and amazing to think that you're only one third done or maybe half done. So can't wait to see what else is coming. I uh, just wanted to ask maybe if you could share some of your learnings that you've had from colleagues in low and middle income countries and how that's impacted your career, uh, your approach uh, in, in the U.S. setting. Yeah, I mean, I think I'm talking to this. Um, I think, um, you know, and we just, it just kind of, you know, alluded to this already, but I think um, the the most important thing for me, and it was it was hard to learn, was to meet people where they're at, um, and to really, as mentioned, kind of see what the community needs. And if you think back to kind of my malnutrition program, I didn't really have any interest in doing malnutrition. Um, I was there as an ER trainee, as an infectious disease trainee, and um, and you just do what people need, um, and it needs to come come from within. Um, and I also think 
Um, I think you need to listen to what people also want for not only their community, but for, for their careers. I mean, some people are stuck in a job and you're like knocking on the door saying, hey, this kid is dying or, you know, whatever. We should do a big project about this, but maybe that's not what their passion is. And so how do we work together so that you can pursue your passion within medicine and improve healthcare in the way that is your vision? Because it's not about my vision. Um, and so, you know, I think really doing, really listening and thinking about what people need personally and for the community is kind of the biggest message that I've taken home. I have another question too. Barry. I, uh, I, I mean, I had read all your CV and uh, seen what you've done, but now when you talk about it, it's quite overwhelming. But the most overwhelming part, what you did, and probably you may not even realize it, is that you created a legacy at one of the top institutions in pediatrics at Children's Hospital, at an Ivy League university to create a global fellowship. That's a lasting legacy. And you walked the path first and you did it. That means many will follow you decades to come and help many more children. And that's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Bob, did you want to say something again? Terry, I want to congratulate you on the direction your career has taken you uh, and the contributions that you have made on a global level throughout the world. And all I can say is that top University of Pennsylvania is very fortunate to have you uh, as a leader in global health. So congratulations. And, and, and may I add this, that the, the um, separations we have between countries, between nations are artificial. And what you do is erase those so that we say that every child born, right, deserves to grow to his or her potential. And that's really going to help this world immensely. So I say bravo as well. And congratulations on those beautiful three children that you have. <laughs> yes. uh, I don't see how you balance you. your international work <laughs> with taking care of a, a, a growing family. So congratulations on they that. Come well. with me. <laughs> oh, that's, that's wonderful. They'll follow in your footsteps. Yes, <laughs> ours did too. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, any other comments or questions from the audience? I want to reflect a little on Casa's comments because, um, I mean, the reality is that our, I'm going to say, you know, our collective institutions between CHOP and Penn, um, we don't, frankly, quite have the tradition of some other really great institutions around the world. We have an enormous number of people doing incredible work. Two examples, you know, our inaugural Susk and, and the Winter Award winner, Casa, and of course, Carrie this year. And, um, you know, we don't have a school of public health, which I think is a detriment, frankly, to supporting us and helping us through as we go along. Um, much of our funding is hospital-based. The moment when we leave the hospitals, somebody's not billing and the money, you know, goes down a little bit potentially. Um, so it really is, I think, up to, as, just as Casa was saying, the generation of folks like you and Carrie, some of the slightly older folks and the mid-career mid folks and the younger folks out in the audience to carry this tradition on so that we continue to build because I think we're doing great, um, but we can, we can do even better. And a lot of that is centered around continuing to uh, institutionalize global health at CHOP and at Penn. I actually think it's more institutionalized at CHOP than Penn, to be frank about it, um, but maybe that's because I see the Penn side more. Uh, and Andrew keeps telling me it's better at CHOP. Yeah. No, but I actually think <laughs> Yeah, you have a little bit of a longer tradition. So um, thank you all for coming. Um, I wa want to remind everybody that there is a reception uh, afterwards. I want to thank uh, Alejo and Maria, Megan and the rest of the, Charlotte and the rest of the Global Health team. Also the Medical Student Global Health Interest Group who helped organize things and particularly the reception part. And of course, again, congratulate Carrie.